Hello, everyone. Delighted to be here. Began this journey a long time ago, and it's really a lot of gratitude I have that uh, we're at a point where it's actually happening. So today I'm going to talk about falling in love with learning. It all has to do with children, with my love, and how we can truly take this technology to change their lives. So we know that uh, we're at a point now where there are a bunch of transformations take place. Uh, first of all, when we had just television, actually, I saw the first television <laughs> uh, that was happening in 1953 that came into my home. So we were passive viewers in that case. And then, of course, a few years later, when we had uh, computer games, we became more active. And it's interesting, when children started playing games, computer games, TV, uh, video games, they stopped watching TV. They've become more active, as you know. And then, of course, now what we have is this other transformation where we're now breaking through the screen. There's nothing to separate us from that other alternative reality, and especially if we have immersion in that. And so through this transformation, we see the same thing happening that I discovered in the first part of my career. First 23 years of my career, I was designing cockpits for fighter airplanes for the U.S. Air Force and Navy. And the problem was, of course, we had very difficult problems to solve in those aircraft. And so we built a lot of helmet tracking systems and helmet-mounted displays and built simulators to test these concepts of building a cockpit that you wear. And so what you see here is my Darth Vader helmet that I built in 1981. Uh, this helmet cost about a million dollars and uh, with uh, eight VAX computers to run it and things like that. But at that time, we began to reinforce the things we'd seen for a number of years, that this is a dynamite technology. And it was dynamite because of what we remembered, what we retained, the ability to rapidly assimilate information. We knew it. We saw it happening over and over again in our test. Not only tests on the ground, but tests in the air. And I was flying these things in the air, so I know what, what was happening. So, in 1989, I beat my sword into a plowshare and became an academic at the University of Washington. Started a laboratory called the HIT Lab. In the HIT Lab, we started working on how can we use this technology for other things, especially for teaching and learning. One of the first experiments we did was with Garfield High School, which is a local high school in Seattle. We wanted to find out, can you really teach kids uh, complex subjects with this? We worked with the chemistry department. They said, well, kids really are having a tough time understanding an abstract thing like electron orbitals. Perhaps we could take this module and let's see if uh, virtual reality would help with that uh, course instruction. So what we did is we took three treatments. We had one treatment, which was a standard method of the blackboard and textbook and the teacher lecturing. We had the second treatment, which was basically a computer-aided instruction system. And then the third treatment was actually a virtual reality experience where you're shrunk down to the size of an atom, and basically you assembled an atom. You went into an atom building room, you took protons and neutrons, put them together in a nucleus, and then you'd take an electron out of this bin, and you'd give it a spin, give it an energy level, and then place it in an orbit. And that created, you know, a hydrogen atom. And then you'd add more uh, atomic numbers and build up the shells and things like that. So at the end of this module, we tested students how, what their uptake on this. It's interesting that we found that the smart kids, the kids who were making A's, didn't make any difference. They, uh, they got it. Uh, even the ones that were doing the, the more abstract uh, uh, teaching situation. But the most interesting thing is, the kids who were making C's and D's and failing chemistry caught up with the smart kids when they used VR. And when we tested them a year later, they were better. So these kids weren't dumb at all. The problem was they had to learn a different way. They had to have a whole body learning experience to make that happen. And so we've seen that over and over and over again in our experiments. So what this has told us over the years is that we have this amazing power to get to the brain. Because what we're doing is tapping spatial memory. And I've used this illustration uh, over and over again that it's, right, uh, it's like writing on the brain with indelible ink. You never forget it. You never forget a good virtual experience. So look what's happening with the technology now. So here we are, a typical, <laughs> maybe a typical family. So we all are absorbed by our devices. The kids go up into their bedrooms and they're playing with their devices. Uh, the parents are off doing their things. So technology, in this case, is actually separating us, isn't it? It's putting screens in between us. 
And what I want to do is propose a new way, a new concept to the way we want to use technology in the homes. Basically to turn the living room into a classroom, a lifelong learning classroom, because that's where the best classroom in the world should be anyway. So what if in this living room with the technology we have, that we could go on an expedition as a family? Let's say, for example, we wanted to discover in our own starship, our family starship, where there might be life out in other planets, hypothetically. So our starship could fly at warp speed, and we can go throughout the galaxy looking for that, and we have virtual instruments we can send down to explore these planets. And what we do is in this starship, you see all those shuttle bays underneath. We can send out shuttlecraft to go examine those uh, particular planets, put our probes out, find out if indeed we could live there. And so we go into the shuttle bay and we walk around our shuttlecraft and uh, we see it from different views as we're walking around the shuttle bay, and then, of course, we go inside of it. Now, it turns it inside. I did this in my lab at University of Washington. I hired some drama PhD students <laughs> to build a set. I gave them 100 bucks, and they built this set. And there's all plywood and things like that. But you put on a headset, and it comes alive. So now this is what you see when you're inside this shuttlecraft. And so the idea then is to launch that shuttlecraft. And I think we are missing a slide here. A movie. Oh, we want to play the movie. Okay? You're in the shuttle bay. We're going to launch out of the shuttle bay and go explore the planet. Okay? So here we're going retro. We're retrofiring our, um, our warp drive engines into orbit around a particular planet we want to uh, explore. And, um, and then we uh, go into our shuttle bay, launch out of the shuttlecraft, fly around the mothership just to make a, take a good look if everything's okay there. And then we go into a re-entry into the atmosphere of that um, planet. And then when we land on the planet, we um, basically get out of our shuttlecraft, walk outside, and there we're standing on this planet. Now, it turns out this particular planet is Mars. So we've taken the imagery from Mars, and now you're walking on it. You're there. The perspective you have and the memories that you gain from that are incredible. And you're doing this as a family, because the family is piloting the ship with all the particular functions that have to be performed virtually. So think about that. Think about the expeditions families could go on. All the virtual worlds that we could have in our home to go on these kind of trips. And no matter the age of a member of the family, even grandparents could participate in this. And to go visit these worlds every day. And this now, is what's going to be happening in homes because we're going to have the technology to do that. Perhaps we're even going to have more technology in the homes than we'll ever see in the schools. We have it already. So, what kind of worlds will we do? Well, it's going to be a technically advanced landscape. The walls disappear and you go to these places. And maybe not everybody's going to be immersed in a headset, but others will be immersed or participating with their own devices as they're in this network and the local network that you have in your home. And what this can do is awaken in children, especially, what they want to do, what they want to do with their careers, the juices that are inside of them. And uh, the parents now become, in this case, the chief educator of their children. We too often, you know, just send them off to school and expect the teachers to do that. We should be doing that in the homes. Teachers can supplement that and augment it, certainly. So what this, in the end, will do is actually help the kids, our children, uh, understand what's going on in the world and also learn how to be, uh, have a marketable skill and how a contribution can be made. And what we want to do is build a fire in their belly. We want them to be on fire and excited about what can happen out there and not just sort of wait for it to happen. And we give them that opportunity when we're in, this, in the schools. By the way, this is in South Africa, in, in Grahamstown. Um, where a, a very interesting experiment took place in using uh, computers with kids. I'll tell you about that later. So, the question is, are families prepared to meet this? Are they prepared to actually get into this enough to where they can become the teachers and, uh, uh, for this next generation? Now, we, to answer this question, 
we've started doing some experiments in the virtual world society. And we have uh, an opportunity with our first laboratory of the, here they are, the Gustafsons, if the Gustafsons will stand up here, okay? This is Paul and Barbara Gustafson, okay? They are parents. These are real people. <laughs> These aren't virtual people, thanks. So we've started an experiment and, uh, with the Gustafsons who've actually equipped their home with a learning laboratory with their son, Ryan, uh, to find out how uh, virtual reality can be used as a teaching tool and to help with some challenges that they have in their home. And so we're going to be telling you a lot more about this. We have a session tomorrow. It's a whole Virtual World Society session, track, that we're going to have. And on Friday from 1.30 to 1.45, um, we will be talking about the experiences that they've had. So you'll have, you can answer questions about that, that experience then. Now, in my own case, I have to say that my parents were really the main people that taught me because what they did was they recognized my interest and they got me stuff to work with, to play with. And that's why parents are so important in this whole process of education. But what they did was they helped me buy parts so I could build a rocket telemetry system. Listen, I'm 15 years old here. I built this rocket telemetry system to um, basically play with how would you telemeter data down if you shot up a rocket. I was about to blow myself up shooting off rockets, but that was what I did. And that led to my Air Force career, Lieutenant Furness wearing the very first helmet mount display, and then the virtual retinal display where we scan an image directly on the retina, which has led to Magic Leap and another number of these other technologies are out there now. But it all happened because my parents did this for me. They recognized it and they supported me to pursue this bliss. So, you have some action items. I'm going to give you a homework assignment. Good professors do that. So, your action item is to go to two uh, booths in the exhibit area. Number 10, which is an Airstream trailer, you'll see that. And, uh, and also 405, where you can join up the Virtual World Society. We're also going to have an award ceremony tonight when the Augie Awards are presented. We're going to present the second Nexton Award and uh, Nexton Prize. Uh, and you'll be excited to hear about that, what's happening. We want you to um, attend this track that happens tomorrow. Thankful to the AWE organizers for helping us with this. It is our very first World Con uh, Congress and, uh, and, and looking at how we can use this technology to lift mankind. And then, of course, go to the booth and go, or go online to join the Virtual World Society. One of the highlights of our uh, meeting tomorrow is we're going to have Nick Vujic to speak to us. This man is amazing. And uh, if you haven't heard his story, he'll certainly be telling you about it. But he was born this way, without arms and legs. And what he's made out of his life with the challenges that he's had. And we are so excited that he was willing to come here because usually he speaks to audiences of 80,000 people. And he's going to be talking to us tomorrow and also of his passion, and his passion about what we can do with virtual reality, augmented reality for education. And uh, we're looking forward to joining up with him, being part of the family that works on this. And then uh, be sure to go to see the Airstream. This is one of the things we're hoping to do uh, in the future, is take this Airstream on the road. So it's all throughout the United States, where people will be able to see, uh, families will be able to see what they could do with virtual reality in their homes. Thank you very much, and look forward to seeing you to, uh, tomorrow and this evening. Thank you.